A warm welcome to my fellow young professionals and their supporters. I, Brandy Armstrong, IEEE Oceanic Engineering Society VP of Professional Activities, have been working with Marine Technology Society member Catherine Weathers as co-chair of the YP program to ensure that YP programs become a regular feature at future oceans conferences. Through our genuine engagement with the societies, we each have found mentorship, support, and peers whose stories continue to inspire us. We hope to bring the same to you all here today. This program is geared towards young professionals, which is defined as those under 35 or five years out of their highest degree. Young professionals are interested in elevating their professional image, expanding their global network, connecting with peers locally, and giving back to their communities. Young professional programs at Oceans Conferences play a pivotal role in providing young professionals the opportunity to connect with and learn from their peers. This helps them to find mentors and collaborators, but most importantly, it helps them to find support and inspiration. Additional information on OES and MTS Young Professional Programs are available at our booth in the exhibitor space. We'd love to hear your honest feedback on the program as well as what you'd like to see in the future. At this time, we have four young professionals presenting on how their careers have evolved, including difficulties overcome, lessons learned, and successes and support received along the way. This brief introduction will be followed by their presentations. All questions will be held until the question and answer period following the presentations. I encourage you to actively engage with the speakers during the question and answer session by placing your questions and comments into the chat box. Please listen and enjoy and learn from the experiences of these young professionals that they are about to share. Our first panelist of the day is Dr. Patricia Supi Dallander, researcher research oceanographer at the Water Institute of the Gulf. Thank you, Brandy. I really appreciate having this opportunity to, to speak and connect with, um, with young professionals. As, as Brandy said, I agree this is a really important venue and I appreciate having the opportunity. So can I give you a little information because the, the type of work I do, not everyone may be familiar with, um, you know, as compared to federal science work or academia. Um, so the Water Institute of the Gulf is a not-for-profit independent research organization. So although we're not not-for-profit, we're not an advocacy organization. We're not trying to, to save anything, um, you know, we're, we're not a charity in that sense. Um, that just means that our primary mission is to support decision making related to community resilience um, and to ecosystem uh, conservation and restoration by providing targeted um, applied science. And we particularly emphasize uh, integrated and interdisciplinary approaches. So what do I do there? Um, as Brian said, I'm a research oceanographer. I specialize in hydrodynamics, uh, morphodynamics, and sediment transport. So I do a lot of numerical modeling, a lot of field data analysis, decision support tools. And uh, so right now I work um, out of St. Petersburg, Florida um, full time, although I'm affiliated with the Water Institute's New Orleans office. Um, prior to coming here, I had spent um, my career working with, as a federal um, scientist with the USGS and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, again, doing very similar things. So applied science really targeted toward answering uh, you know, specific research questions that folks need to make better decisions, either to, to make more resilient communities or to make better decisions as far as um, protecting ecosystems. Um, how did I get here? extremely non-linearly um, in a lot of different ways. This is uh, that little red line is showing moves that I've made um, professionally um, for either education or work. And um, it's this is sort of the first lesson learned. Um, you know, a lot of people I think have a very, figure out very early on that they have a specific research focus that they're interested in, which is really valuable. Um, other folks, myself included, have a, a relatively diverse background. And one of the things that I've found in my career is that, you know, the way you market yourself and connect maybe differs a little bit depending on which sort of that category you fall in. Um, so for myself, I've found that having a diverse background um, has given me some, some skill sets that other folks may not have, but I have to sometimes explain um, to people where I can I can bring that skill set into play because I may not look like my resume I may not look like um, someone who's focused in very specifically on on the the uh, you know for example the topic that a job is related to. So my education background you know again you'll start to see that new nonlinearity early. 
Um, my bachelor's is in physics and math. Um, I actually did uh, uh, my undergraduate thesis was on a theoretical math proof. Um, I did a master's in oceanography. I worked on remote sensing um, of beaches, extracting uh, features of, of uh, the near shore and how those, looking at how those changed in time. Um, and then I did a master's and PhD in mechanical engineering with a specialty in fluid dynamics um, at the University of Florida, where I was studying laser diagnostics of aerosol particles. Um, so again, you can see I'm, I'm not cleanly an engineer or a scientist, and I've done a lot of different research topics. And, you know, what I've found is that there's two sides of that coin. It can either look like, you know, this... Uh, sort of, uh, of uh, jack of all trades, master of none. And the key is to recognize that, you know, in fact, what that enables is having experience with a variety of different problems and different disciplines that have different approaches that can be leveraged, um, you know, brought to bear on new problems. And so that, you know, again, is a lesson that, that I've learned to really, really focus on that when, when thinking about new positions or moving up in my current position. Uh, work experience is, is equally diverse. Um, I had a, a, a couple of different stints actually with the U.S. Geological Survey at the Woods Hole Coastal Marine Science Center, a postdoc, as well as a research assistant position. Um, in those cases, both of those cases, I was looking at sediment mobility on the continental shelf. Um, when I was with the Army Corps of Engineers, I was actually uh, looking at water quality and specifically looking at um, modeling the impact of menhaden, which are a fish, um, on, on water quality. And then I was with the U.S. Geological Survey, St. Pete um, Coastal Marine Science Center. I was looking at, at beach systems. So again, you know, you might kind of question how all of these things hang together, but there's a lot of the same skill sets involved in numerical modeling and understanding fluids. And the diversity there uh, really kind of leads to things where you can, you can bring to bear skill sets um, that, that are maybe non-traditional. Um, and that, you know, again, that's that's sort of the the take home in some ways of, of my career. Um, you know, for example, some of the work that I've done that's really been recognized highly um, was kind of that that just taking that approach. Um, I've received an award from Army Corps of Engineers for Menhaden and fish modeling. I'm, I'm not a biologist. I know nothing about fish, but it was applying a uh, conservation of mass, conservation of energy engineering approach to a fish. Um, I ended up, I got the PCASE award. It was for um, looking at the movement of sand and oil following Deepwater Horizon, and it was leveraging a modeling approach that I originally developed for sediment on the continental shelf. You know, so again, uh, being creative about opportunities and thinking about what you can bring to the table rather than kind of deciding a priori what somebody might be looking for, um, I think is a real, real asset. Um, you know, putting together this, this uh, presentation, it's sort of an odd thing to speak about, thinking about how you, you got where you are. Um, you know, I think some of the, the key enablers in, in being successful in some of those uh, positions, you know, advocacy, advocacy and support are really, really vital to advancement. Um, you know, supervisors and advisors, particularly as you're getting into that bridge between, you know, young professional and mid-career, you know, people make assumptions right or wrong as far as, you know, people's contribution to, to team efforts. And, you know, you want to work with senior people that, that you know, make sure to highlight, you know, folks, folks' contributions. You know, work culture is really important. You know, meritocracy, you know, I think one of the questions that was asked, you know, is how do you know when to move on? You know, really, depending on the position you're in, you know, academia or government or, or private, the metrics of success will be different. But, you know, where, wherever you are, the, the most success I've had is in places where it's really clear what those metrics of success are, you know, what the expectations are, and that, you know, meeting those or exceeding those results in, in you know, people being able to move up. Um, the other thing, peer network, you know, and this is this is a great venue for this. You know, peer network is really important. I remember being in school and and seeing these, you know, titans of the field, you know, legends in in the in the various uh, fields, you know, and thinking, wow, it'd be amazing to work for them, and kind of internalizing and realizing that that myself and my peers, those are the next great titans, you know, and it's important to connect to people that are both within your discipline and, you know, at the peripheral, because, um, again, there's a lot of really great interdisciplinary work that's a big emphasis right now, I think, and it's it's got a lot of great opportunities. 
Um, so continuing to, to build that network and to maintain those connections, um, both with senior people as advisors um, that are, are good supporters, um, as well as with peers is, is really important. Um, you know, I, I, when I look back at, at you know, those, those kind of moving around careers and I think about where the places were that really boosted my career, you know, it's usually associated with a person that was always in my, my court. Uh, kind of the flip side of that, lessons learned, you know, again, trying to think about, you know, it's a little weird to, to self-assess one's own career, but, um, you know, as far as time to look for a new position, you know, I, I have moved around a lot. In most cases, I was going to some place, not, not necessarily leaving some, you know, from some place. You know, I was in a contract position moving to a new one or wanted to, you know, move to a different location, you know, in terms of geography. Um, you know, I think it's always good to be open to options. That was something that I um, and was not at every point in my career. Um, you know, I think having, being willing to, to look at the field and see what, you know, everything that's out there at all times is good. But I think it's really uh, time, you know, to start actively looking for a new position when, you know, those things I mentioned, you know, if you don't feel like you have a, a, an advisor that's really in your court, you know, or if you're, if you're struggling to identify what your, you know, what the metrics are to move off, you know, move on, uh, move up where you are, that's really time to look. Um, when, lo you know, when looking for a new position, either internally or asking for raise or moving up, you know, again, I think the, the trick there is that um, I know personally, I will sometimes fall into a trap of, oh, I'm not what they're, I'm not what they're looking for. And, you know, well, of course I'm not. If, if, if I can't convince myself, then I'm not going to convince anybody else. Um, so, you know, starting from the assumption that, you know, that, there, that you have something to bring to the table and, and really kind of articulating with specificity to yourself what those things are and then having that conversation, I think, is the, the, the big thing. Um, you know, advocating for work-life balance. For me, the first barrier, certainly not the only barrier, but the first barrier was internal. I had put a lot of expectations of either what I expected of myself of, of, as far as how many hours to put in or what to do or what I was projecting onto to someone else as far as their expectations. So for me, the first hurdle was kind of recognizing that, has been recognizing that. It's still a real challenge for me. Um, but, you know, deciding what, you know, how what I want it to look like Again, thinking through specifically what adjustments I want to make. It's easiest when you're starting a new position because you can kind of negotiate it. But, um, you know, even with, within a given position, you know, decide what, where you really want to be and then have a very, you know, what I found works is a very, you know, objective kind of conversation where you're willing to kind of give and, and take and really hi highlight where, you know, choices may benefit or at least be neutral to an employer as far as like flexible time or flexible work location, et cetera. And then kind of the last thing I'll, I'll say, and it sounds kind of squishy, but it, it's, it's important is, uh, you know, enjoy what you do. I think um, personally, one of the things that I found in, in work is that I tend to second guess myself if I'm unhappy with something, you know, I'm too sensitive or, well, it's not so bad or every job has good pros and cons or, or whatnot, you know, and I think, you know, that, that's true. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it, it may be that, that, you know, you're, you're being sensitive to something, but I've, I've found that, that a lot of times having that feeling of something being not quite right, not being enthusiastic about, about going to the work in the morning, you know, maybe that's a trigger to kind of look objectively again that, you know, do I, you know, objectively, do I have these opportunities for success? Do I have this support? You know, and, and if you don't, then I think that's the trigger, you know, again, where, you know, you start looking at the C, you know, what other opportunities are out there, either within an organization or, or beyond it. Um, so that's all I have. And I know the questions are going to come at the, at the end. So I look forward to that discussion. Thank you. Our next panelist is Christopher Witt, PE and Project Engineer at JASCO Applied Sciences. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Christopher Witt. And uh, I will just start by talking a little bit about myself. I am an electrical engineer. And now I work as a project manager in uh, Ocean Acoustics Company. Uh, it's a small niche. We do specialized uh, measurements in, uh, in the ocean. Uh, but aside from my day job, I'm also a volunteer. I'm a musician. I like ultimate frisbee. And uh, I love to travel and I like animals. So it's just to give you a bit of an idea of, of myself. But my job at JASCO involves um, measuring all kinds of natural and man-made sounds in the ocean. 
Jasco is this very small, well, I think of it as a very small company. I suppose it might be a medium-sized company now, but uh, it's a consulting company that works in a very specialized field. So I get the opportunity to do a lot of interesting projects, challenging projects in different parts of the world. And there's a lot of variety in my job. I started out with Jasco about 15 years ago. And um, at the start of my, my uh, employment with Jasco, we, we were doing a very uh, specific type of measurement in the Arctic. And it was a really neat thing for me as a young engineer to be challenged to learn something new, to design moorings, to uh, take care of logistics, to get equipment to the field, to get the measurement done, and to start the analysis process. Uh, I've, over the years, I've been involved with uh, doing our equipment uh, design and then manufacturing and uh, data collection in the field, doing automated analysis of the resulting data sets. And in the recent years, I've started to do more training and mentoring and project management. So over that time, I've learned some of my strengths. And I think that two strengths that I like to uh, keep in mind are I like to be able to see a big picture. When I'm presented with a complicated um, problem, a complicated situation, I want to abstract what's uh, really important, what the, the central themes are, and see how everything fits together and that, that use that to help solve the problems. But I've also always been uh, if, um, keen to mentor people and, and help the people around me succeed, to teach people. So I've tried to paint a positive picture of where I am now, but the path that got me here, it was not a straight line at all. So in undergrad, I, I was a very uh, academically minded student. I really liked school and I did well. I was pretty focused on it, but then I decided to continue to do a master's degree and I chose my own topic and it was a bit too ambitious. I chose a topic where I didn't really know what my outcome was going to be and that's maybe sometimes a good challenge to take on, but I didn't do very well with it. And so I kind of almost burned out on that. So after I did uh, complete my master's, I took a few years to work in an unrelated field. I did some sound and lighting production for uh, you know music concerts and that sort of thing. And that was a, a nice break and it maybe did connect to some of my interest in acoustics and to some of my interest with electronics, uh, but it was really quite different. And then to get back into something more academic, I took a job teaching in a technical college and that was uh, overseas, that was in the Middle East. So that was a really nice challenge that got me some different life experience, got me exposed to different cultures. It fit in with my existing interest in travel. Uh, but then when it was time to come back home, I just kind of accidentally fell into the job at JASCO. Uh, there was a job posting. I don't even remember how I came across it. And I didn't really have the qualifications they were looking for, but I had enough relevant background, I guess, and, and convinced the uh, owners in the interview that I was a suitable candidate. And, and then I've, I've been at JASCO for 15 years. What have I learned in that time? Um, well, the main thing I've learned is that I haven't really figured it out. And there was no path that I had laid out ahead of me at the start to get where I am now, even though where I am now is a place I'm very happy with. Um, but it's been important to know myself. And, and again, I didn't know at 15 years ago or 20 years ago, what I know now, but um, I I've did know some things about myself and that's helped me guide me along the way. And I've learned more and that's helped me to make better decisions. I'll, I'll uh, echo one thing that's already been said, which is the value of a network. And uh, this one, I really wish I'd learned much, much earlier. I thought in the start of my career that I was going to succeed and I was going to rock it to the top with really good technical skills and a great work ethic and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And I've really come to realize that the people that you know, the, the connections you, you make, the, the relationships you have with your colleagues, with your uh, peers in other companies and other um, uh, organizations, that is at least as valuable as your technical ability or your work, work ethic. We did uh, think a little bit about some questions like work-life work -life balance. We were asked to think about this. And I, I, again, just like the career path, I haven't got that figured out. But what I've learned, uh, I'm actually going through a very busy time right now at work. And the thing that's been very clear to me is nobody's going to be responsible for my work-life balance except me. Um, I, you know, I'm a small company. There's lots of variety of work and maybe a little more 
uh, personal connection with the company management and company owners. And maybe that's not the same as in a large company, but I think in any work environment I've heard about, the the company's really only going to be responsible for meeting the contractual obligations, getting their job done, even if they do care about their employees. And I, I feel like my employer does care about us uh, very well, but um, at the end of the day, uh, they are not going to be responsible for my happiness outside of work. Career advancement, uh, boy, it's been something I've struggled with. You know, again, I started out thinking that my uh, my excellent technical skills were going to be the key to success. Um, but what's really worked for me has been to um, build to, I guess I didn't really put it on the bullet points on the slide here, but it's to build those connections, that network. And for me, it started out with that mentoring thing that I mentioned earlier. I would see the big picture in the little corner of the company I was in. I would see the, the gaps that need to be filled and I would work on them. But then at the same time, I'd be thinking of, okay, somebody else needs to do this after me. So I would train someone else to do what I was doing. And as long as I keep doing that, then my employer knows that I'm valuable because I'm always going to be busy doing something productive and leave behind me a, um, an area that's now filled, that's now solid. And uh, so I, I, can't identify a lot of uh, mentors that I've had along the way, but I'm learning the hard way that mentors, the mentor mentee relationship is really valuable. And so that's something I'm now seeking out a bit more. Um, and I mentioned performance reviews within um, specifically when I'm looking for like uh, salary negotiations. And I've been in one company for a long time. So some people will say the way to, to get a, a salary increase is to change jobs. And that may very well be true, but, for me, I've been fairly happy with my job. So I'm, uh, when I look for my total compensation package, I think about it from the perspective of my employer. What is it I'm doing well? What do you need me to do better? And when I can say I'm meeting those things, then I have a case for um, the compensation that I think I deserve. And how do I deal with change? Um, again, similar themes to what's already been mentioned. I, I've looked at um, times in my career where I start to feel a little bit bored or maybe a bit dissatisfied. And that is a flag for me to start identifying, okay, what's a gap in, maybe not in my satisfaction, maybe a gap in my work responsibilities or, or a gap in my um, skills that I have and start to develop those new skills. And so the move into project management came from a period like that where I had sort of plateaued and the responsibilities I was in and I was looking for something different and wanted to develop uh, the skills to manage and to lead and actually I didn't think about this when I was making my slides but um, one of the ways that I developed those skills was through volunteering I did mention at the beginning volunteering so I started volunteering for organizations outside of work and that gave me the opportunity to understand some of the aspects of working with people, developing a network, leading teams, teaching people. And that brought together a lot of the interests and the um, and the abilities that I think that I was already developing. Another thing that uh, often comes up is how to deal with job interviews. And I've gone to a total of two job interviews in my life, so I'm not very good at speaking from the perspective of the interviewee. But now that I'm in a more of a um, management role, I start to participate in interviews from the other side. And it's been interesting to see the variety of experience that people have. Um, what I would say to myself, my future self, if I interview for another job, is make sure I know the opportunity that I'm applying for. It's amazing how many people go into, go into an interview and don't um, really understand the company that's posting the position or, or the type of job that they're applying for. And, and then I try to, I would suggest try to switch perspectives. Think what it is the employer is looking for. I had, I, I was in an interview at one point where the job was clearly about a repetitive task. It was something that you had to be able to do routinely and correctly a lot. And when the person was asked what their weaknesses were, they said, oh, well, you know, I, I, I like variety. I don't really like routine work. <laughs> well, that's not really knowing the, the, what the employer was looking for. But on the flip side, um, 
turn your weakness into strength is a really good interview technique. And you're going to be asked a hard question in an interview. You're going to be asked, what is your weakness? And I was in another interview where the person said, well, I took a job where I had a hard time integrating into the team, into the community. And so I, um, I took some coaching. I, I did got some sought outside advice. I improved myself and that gave me the skills to build a good relationship and develop the team, uh, um, it, build a solid team in that job. So I, I think there was some really interesting um, learnings to be able to switch around and see the, the interview from the perspective of the employer. So I think those were all the things I had to say and uh, I'll turn it over back to Randy. Our next panelist is Nikita Shio-Roll, founder and CEO of YME and Cat Island Conservation Institute. Hi, uh, so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. My name is Nikita Shield Roll, and I'm joining you today from the Bahamas. And I have a bit of a, a very untraditional uh, story to uh, my conservation, my ocean conservation career. And uh, that was because I founded the organization that I run, Young Marine Explorers as an undergraduate student at the University of Miami, uh, it would have been in 2007. And so my journey of, uh, through my evolution in ocean science has also been paralleled with my journey as an entrepreneur. And uh, this has been the most exhilarating and fulfilling experience um, and life commitment and journey, and also one of the most challenging ones. And with that, I want to share uh, one of the most valuable pieces of advice that I can share with you is, one, to remember that life is really like the ocean. Sometimes it is flat, calm, and beautiful, and others, it can be raging like a category six, as we refer it to Hurricane Dorian, um, that can cause unimaginable change in your life. And for me, one of the most valuable lessons that I've learned has been to learn to flow with life and the challenges that come with that. Um, so a little bit about my career background, Young Marine Explorers and the Cat Island Conservation Institute is a nonprofit organization and um, an institute now focused on driving the establishment of resilient islands capable of withstanding the changes uh, due to the current climate crisis that we are in and also finding a balance where humans are able to live in harmony and live thriving lives with nature, especially for those of us who are living on small island nations, or as I much prefer to refer to them as, uh, big ocean nations like the Bahamas. And I believe it's really, really important to learn to love and trust yourself. This was one of the biggest challenges that I had when it came to um, challenges in my career because my self-worth was tied to, it started off with it being tied to my academic performance as a student and I was very, um, I did very, very well academically most of the time and I was usually often very, very busy. And so when I was doing well, things were great and I was on top of the world. But then as I advanced further in my career and things became a little bit more challenging, you know, I would receive a rejection letter or I didn't receive grant funding for a project that I was working on. And I would find that I, my self-worth, how I believed in myself was completely tied to an external uh, interpretation of, of my being. And so I want to remind everyone that while science is something that we do, clearly ocean science is a big part of all of our lives, we are not just uh, the scientists, we are not just defined by the work that we do, the number of publications that we have, whether or not we um, are the leader in our, in our field. Uh, and, and that's really important. And so the second piece of advice I want to share 
is become very clear on your personal definition of success because every single one of us has a different definition of success. For some, it may be to be a mother and a scientist. Uh, for others, you may want to be a you're just single, completely focus on your career. And uh, like myself, you may have um, multiple endeavors, whether you are, for example, myself, I run the Cat Island Conservation Institute. I am a marine conservation biologist, and I do a lot of research focused on coral reefs and connecting my community to science and the understanding of science. Additionally, I uh, work a lot right now with the United Nations, specifically with UNESCO. I am a UNESCO partner, um, and I focus, what's been really exciting, um, and this has been specifically because I have mastered the, the art of networking. And it's been really difficult for me sometimes, because I know sometimes you know, you'll go to conferences, and you're, especially if you go by yourself and you don't really know someone, uh, being in these large rooms where you have to you know, be vulnerable, introduce yourself, try and find a connection, it can be a bit awkward. Uh, and so what, um, what has helped me and what I want to encourage you uh, as you are exploring networking and connecting with people is that you have something incredible to share with the world. You have your contribution that you are making to ocean science, and the world needs that gift that you have. And don't be afraid of sharing your passion, sharing your interests with someone else. Um, additionally, please, please, please really work on developing a support system. And this is a support system for your, your life. You can't science if your life is falling apart. And I know this intimately because uh, three years ago, I, I, I burnt out and I burnt out really badly because I did not have a healthy work-life balance. I was pushing it all to uh, build and establish myself in my career. And you know, I was working, trying to work like I did when I was in college, not sleeping, you know, 17, 20 hours, just go, 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 and that's not sustainable. And especially if we are, and as we are focused in uh, ocean conservation, different aspects of ocean conservation, sustainability has to be at the heart of our lifestyle, which also influences and um, feeds into how we do science. So something that I've been uh, working on, and this is a daily practice for me, is identifying how can I be extremely intentional with my time. So if I am working on a project, working on a grant, and I realize that mentally I'm just not there, as opposed to forcing myself to sit and then be completely unproductive, I'm actually going to stop doing it, walk away, and be really intentional about giving my body what it is that I need whether it's rest, whether it's a jog, a shower, going for a swim. Um, I know right now in the time of COVID-19, things are extremely difficult. Um, and this is what makes it that much more important for us to invest in how we are taking care of ourselves. Because all of us here are working on solving completely complex situations. And when we are stressed and frantic, we're not the best uh, decision makers and problem solvers. And so it's really, really, um, I want to encourage you, and I know this kind of goes against much of the culture, and often I, I believe our industry can be a very toxic culture, but I want to encourage you to rest. Um, again, another uh, a piece of advice that I'd like to share is as you are building your network, don't be afraid to be persistent. I, um, I work with the United Nations right now, and I am now on my third contract with UNESCO as a contractor, and I spent two years developing a relationship with my colleague at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris, 
uh, via email, you know, because I'm based in the Bahamas, working to nurture this relationship. And this took a really long time, uh, but eventually it re resulted in me being able to get my foot in the door and working on um, working on ocean conservation at both a global level and a uh, and a very very local level, like in the community that I work with. And it's okay to not know. So, for example, my first UN contract, I was way over my head. You know, I spent so much time and effort uh, working to get it that I did not fully realize that I wasn't fully equipped to handle some of the reporting mechanisms um, and to fully fulfill that contract. And so this is where I want to encourage you to ask for help. None of us can do this by ourselves. We cannot protect the ocean by ourselves. You know, we need to work together. We need to support each other. And um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, another piece of advice that I'm going to share is take the opportunities that come your way. If it feels right, if it's exciting for you, allow yourself to flow with it because you never know where it's going to take you. The one thing that I've learned from uh, my career is that I now have found myself working in almost every single area tied to some different area as it relates to the ocean and it's really fun and it's also really challenging so as i am building my career as both an entrepreneur and also as a scientist i am really embracing this energy of playing and remembering what inspired me to get into and to do this work um, because Ocean conservation is challenging, and uh, it's really, really important for us to, I think, be grounded in the why we are doing this. And if the why we are doing it is not making us happy, uh, then we need to reevaluate uh, what's next for us. So I believe that's my time. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Please feel free to connect with me. You can find me on Instagram at, at Cat Island Kita, and I would be uh, more than happy to connect with you to learn more about the work that you're doing and to see how we can create a, a healthier and more sustainable ocean. Thank you, Thank you Nikita. I'd like to thank again all of our panelists for inspiring us with their experiences. The remaining time we're going to entertain some questions from the chat box. So if you all would start typing in your questions, um, I'll read those to our panelists and I'll ask, um, I'll try to direct them to who I think might like to answer them. But please, if I don't direct it to you and you want to answer, just jump in. So I'm going to start with there was a lot of questions about you know, or a lot of questions a lot of talk about um being guess being giving yourself some some love right and and trying to work on the the work-life balance and finding a support system right so if you are a young professional who has not figured that out and i'm you know that's a lot of us um and particularly if you're not you don't have a supportive advisor you don't have a supportive um, mentor somehow. How do you go about finding that person? And I'm going to start with Supi because she talked about mentorship a good bit. So it, you know, it's it's one of those uh, frustrating questions that always has a, a bit of an it depends to it. I I think um, you know one one you know, one thing is, is it kind of depends on if you are, you know, where you are in terms of your position or, you know, if you're in, in school, you know, if, if you want to get through with, with, you know, what, what the track you're on, you know, if you want to finish your degree or if there's other reasons why you might want to stay in a position, I think then you can kind of seek out mentors that 
may be able, you know, that may not be your advisor, you know, they may not have direct control over your career, but somebody, you know, sometimes it's really valuable to have someone who can, you can share experiences or frustrations with, or kind of, you know, be an, an ear of, you know, somebody that can provide support in, you know, other ways other than kind of directly impacting your, your career. You know, I think for that, you know, unfortunately, I don't think there's a secret, secret weapon for it. It's kind of, talking to, to people, you know, and, and, you know, finding people that you can, you can maybe, you know, have a beer or, or whatever with, and, you know, kind of, kind of talk things out. You know, I think if you're at a position where you're moving into a different career, then I think, you know, and, and in some ways this is, this is our different position, it's almost practice to learn, you know, I think at least for me, when I came out of school, I knew what I was looking for in terms of like, school and you know looking for a good you know good program and and i i maybe undersold the importance of the advisor and for looking you know for sort of key flags you know things like talking to other grad students about what they thought you know one-on-one -on -one or finding out what kind of like somebody's you know reputation was you know and and what people that worked with them or for them thought you know, so I think when you're changing positions, that's a big one. Don't don't undercut that. It's important to to have that information in hand, even though, like I said, at least for me, you know, I I didn't prioritize that as much as I should have. So, Nikita or Chris, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll just add a little bit. I mean, my experience is very different. Um, working most of my career in a small to medium sized company. Um, you know, I didn't, I don't have a pool of um, uh, uh, senior professionals above me who are not directly, you know, within my chain of command, so to speak. Um, so I, I guess I'll shell a little bit for the, for the um, organizing or, uh, event, you know, the organizers of this event. I, I found that sort of stuff through professional organizations, through communities like IEEE, and, and there's lots of others. I'm not saying it has to be IEEE, but going to local um, technical groups that had, you know, common interests, but weren't necessarily my coworkers was a way for me to find people with, um, uh, uh, common interests, common experiences or, or mentorship or, or advice to, to provide and support. This is such an interesting, uh, conversation because I, you know, you can't, evolve in your career without mentorship one way or another you know so you're always working in relation with someone um but it's really about finding the right fit and i think often when you are younger and you you haven't had as much of the lived life experience uh you can be a bit naive and it's truly out of pure passion um and I think it's really important to really make sure that your relationships, that you are working to build relationships that are established in trust and, and that are equitable between you and whomever it is that you're working with, because then that allows you to be able to speak. And I say this also as a black woman in marine science, you know, a lot of black women, there is, if there's any, um, one listening, we have a new association, Black Women in Marine Ecology and Evolutionary Sciences. And it really is this space for, um, for us to ex express together what we're going through. And, you know, the more that you talk, the more that we share our stories just as people, um, I think it's really important because I know I personally was in a number of situations that were really toxic and really abusive and I didn't know they were. I just thought that's what was supposed to happen, you know? And so having conversations and also about money, we have to learn to like feel comfortable about talking about and talking with our colleagues and our friends about what we're experiencing so we can make sure that they can help us and be there to support us or we can support them if um, people are in toxic relationships because that happens a lot, unfortunately, in the circles that we live in and work in. Yeah, that is so true. And um, it reminds me that so later, 
later during Oceans, I think it's like either next week or the week after that, they're doing a free showing of Picture a Scientist for I think I think it's like four days. So if you guys, again, um, there's, a, there's a, a black woman scientist who they interview on that and it's really a moving documentary and you should check it out. Um, I just wanna pop that in here. I, I wish I knew the exact dates for that. Um, next question, I'm actually, this is also going to go to Nikita first. How do you maintain work-life balance as an entrepreneur, especially with regards to your health and well-being? Oh, that is such a good question. And that is something that honestly every day is um, a challenge for me. You know, I've tried to, perfect example, uh, I haven't slept yet. <laughs> I had a major, major uh, project uh, proposal interview this morning and that I was preparing the presentation for. Um, and, you know, I keep on telling myself, like, I'm not working on Sundays. I'm going to be resting. You know, I have to slow down. But then I, you know, I, here I am <laughs> having, you know, slept and then just like carried on with the day. And what I can say now is that I'm really paying attention, paying attention to how my body feels and doing everything within my power to honor what my body's saying, whether it's sleep, whether it's food, rest, watching Netflix for I don't know how long, you know, like, but giving myself permission to, to rest and really removing the guilt and the, I used to have a lot of guilt and shame about like sitting down, taking a break, not working, not trying to like push my advance, all my things, especially when as an entrepreneur, I'm financially dependent on supporting myself. Um, but now, you know, it's just like, I, I'm going to rest. And then, you know, so please rest. It's, it's radical to rest because sometimes we don't allow ourselves and don't give ourselves that permission. You guys are all doing incredible. I'll, I'll see if Chris or Supi wants to jump in, but I, I do want to say that, um, most of us are not entrepreneurs, but we still struggle with this, this burnout and the work-life balance and sort of recognizing when that's about to happen. So I would love to hear from Chris and Supi about like, how do you recognize that that's coming, that it's, that you're not doing a good job? And then how do you try to rein it in? <laughs> well, that, that was a good prompt because I've been going through a fair bit of uh, work-life balance struggle lately. And uh, one thing for me, I guess everybody's, different. So like I said, you have to kind of know yourself. But for me, if I find myself reacting emotionally in work situations, that's a that's a red, big red flag. I'm like, okay, I'm I'm not taking care of myself. Um, but I was gonna say in answer to the original question about uh maintaining work life balance, especially regarding health and well being, um, my techniques probably don't work for everybody, but for me I found having some schedules and structure helped. Um, I'm not a huge routine person, but if I um, have certain commitments that are not work commitments, like um, playing in a sports league, and then that puts a boundary on how much time I can spend working overtime on a given day. Um, and so that really helped. And, and finding things that I really love to do, like I just can't motivate myself to go do certain like workout activities for their own sake. So I found sports that I love to play because of the game, because of the community, the, the team environment, the, the social aspect or whatever it was, but that was enough to motivate me to go and do something, you know, twice a week, three times a week even. And having that structure then prevented me, like I said, from, you know, I can't just work till 10 PM if I've got to go and play my, play with my team. So that was one thing that worked for me. Yeah. I do something similar. Uh, it's uh, and this is this is highly personality dependent. But I'm a I'm a taskless person at, at work and and everything. I like to have my things to do. And I um, started a, a few years ago adding things for me onto my to do list. And for some reason, mentally having it that I needed to check off, you know, go for a bike ride, you know, go you know do whatever, actually made it me feel a little more comfortable with those being, you know, it wasn't just that I was taking a break and doing nothing. It was that, you know, no, it was, I'm actually accomplishing something. So that, that, that helped me. 
If I can jump in, um, I got a really good piece of advice the other day that said, live your life like a, a diversified portfolio. And that also understanding that it goes in waves. So if you become very clear on what it is that you want to dedicate your time to, um, knowing that sometimes you have to be fully focused in your work, on your career, on writing that grant, writing that paper, but that you know that you're going to catch up, like over time, you're gonna have greater return if you can be really, really dedicated and make sure that your attention is fully focused on what you're doing so you're not losing your precious energy. Because we all have the same amount of, you know, the same 24 hours, and I think it's just about how we become really intentional on how we use that time. Um, I think it's so important. And I also do that. I, I block off time that's mm -hmm. mine. And that really helps me to be like, no, boundaries. Yeah. yeah. Those are two big things, right? Boundaries and time for you. And I think those are things that a lot of young professionals probably, uh, they think that those are the things they can let slide, let slide, right? Like I'm trying to get ahead, I can let those things slide, but you really have to keep those things, right? Or you, like you said, if you, you can't science if you don't take care of yourself, so. Okay, so this next question is from Alice Wang. She says she really enjoyed all of your presentations and she can relate to you. So about marketing yourself, to a seemingly unrelated job, what do you tell yourself to convince yourself you are fit for it? Instead of focus on where you're lacking and how do you market yourself? I'm gonna, again, Supi was, I wanna let Supi go first. Oh, I'll tell you my, my secret is, um, so I, I had an instructor once, a martial arts instructor that, that used to always say, fake it till you make it, um, which, if, firmly works for me like even you know with with an unrelated job i mean it feels very disingenuous but like uh, it, it's a mental thing of just saying you know all right you know so, sometimes I'll, I'll actually think about it through the lens of like all right well what would i say you know how would i look at this if i wasn't me you know if i if i take it out you know I look at my skill sets and resume and try and be objective about it that way you know and just like i say kind of all right you know try and put the insecurities aside, you know, pretend it's like a game, you know, how can I make this work? And it's sort of like that, that's usually what kind of gets me, um, you know, in a place where I can think about how I can sort of, you know, wh where my skill sets can, can fit in and, and be able to communicate that. And, you know, and that's really, you know, as far as marketing for me, it's, if I go through and I do that and I, and I have specificity, if, you know, if the job is, you know, X, Y, or Z, and I have, you know, if I've done the homework, it helps for an interview anyway, right, to, to know specifically what they might be looking for and what you could use, and I've gone through my, you know, my, uh, you know, resume and my skill sets and really thought specifically how I could leverage some of what I've done previously that it convinces me, <laughs> you know, mentally that, that I'm not just making this up, um, you know, that I can do this. And then that's also as far as marketing, you know, being able to give those specific examples, you know, hey, you're looking for somebody to, you know, to do numerical modeling of this kind of system, you know, maybe I haven't worked in that kind of system before, but gosh, there's a lot of similarities to you know, this thing I have built, you know, maybe I could turn that around. So, I, you know, for me, like I said, kind of, kind of faking it <laughs> to, to get there, to get my own mind to, to work for it. And then that sort of specificity of, you know, convincing, you know, here's exactly what I mean by that for a given job um, is both internally how I kind of polish that off and then externally with someone else. Either of you want to jump in? I don't have a lot of like, specific experience with that kind of um, situation in my own career, except just looking at it from the other side of the table, doing job interviews and, and looking at how different people present themselves. Um, I think it is important to, well, on the one hand, often there are, there isn't a perfect candidate for a job. You know, your, your job descriptions, like your ideal is what you really want, but maybe nobody in the pool actually fits it. Um, so you, so you don't have to be intimidated by thinking, oh, I don't like check every box on this list. Um, 
but uh, the flip side is kind of what Supi was, Supi was already saying, which is, you know, find, find the building blocks that you have that um, would enable you to, to meet that expectation or to, to succeed in that role and relate them to some past experience uh, that you can say, well, I didn't do X, but I did X minus Y and I did really well because I have these characteristics or skills or experience. So, so finding, finding the, like the, the building blocks or the common themes and, and maybe that helps. Oh, these are such good questions. I'm really enjoying this panel. It's really nice to reflect. Um, one thing that I think I have learned, I think it's the story that we tell, you know, because we have an array of skills and these skills are many of our skills are transferable, you know, and you, I think sometimes I know I used to be really locked into, I'm a scientist and this, there are certain things that scientists do and this sort of perspective and this past year, especially since COVID, I've really pushed myself beyond um, and allowing myself to add other titles to what I, what I offer, what my skill sets are. Um, and that has been really interesting for me because I realized is that there's different stories that I tell depending on who I'm engaging with. And it's not that it's not me, it's just that I think when we are, when you're trying to market yourself, you're marketing yourself in relation to that person or to that other business. Um, and so it's, it's about being very aware about what is it that they are interested in? What do they want most? And then what skills do I have that align a hundred percent or as close as possible to what it is that they're wanting. I think that's what it is. And this is something that I've learned with also doing a lot of grant writing um, because man, I've been doing some like ju just reframing of stories for the exact same work in my community, but just changing the story depending on whether it's like a NASA grant or a community based grant, you know, but it's, just, mm. it's still the same work. And so I think it's about being clear on who you're communicating with. I agree. It's all about you're feeling a need, right? And so, and Chris hit on this too, right? That there's a job and you need to understand what that job is. And even if you're not perfect, because none of us are perfect for the job, being able to market the skills that you have that would enable you to fill that need, right? No matter what, right? Like, and so I had a similar experience when I first went to Woods Hole and worked with USGS and I was had been working some sort of um, odd jobs, right? I had worked out on a sea turtle island for a couple, like eight months. And then I was working at the Department of Health and Environmental Control and Air Quality, right? So I was working these sort of odd jobs and I applied for a job in Woods Hole. And I'm thinking, I mean, in my mind, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fake, right? I'm a phony. I, you know, I was suffering from some real, you know, uh, imposter syndrome, right? And and I went up there and I was able to sell myself because once I got there and I was talking to the people, I was able to use all my soft skills and I knew that I'm able to figure things out, right? So it wasn't that I knew how to do what they wanted me to do. It was that I knew that I could do it, right? Um, that I would be able to figure it out, that I would be able to work with these people and, and I ended up getting the job. So it really is to be able to, again, market yourself, like you're saying, you're, you're selling yourself to the person and you really, like Chris was saying, need to understand what is that position, right? And, and one thing I think is really important and a lot of people don't think about because they, they get so consumed with the fact that the person they're interviewing with is going to judge them, right? But you're also judging that person, right? You're judging that job. You're judging, judging that company. You maybe don't even want that job. How do you know until you go and you interview, right? And I think that you should think about it in that way, right? Not only are you selling yourself, but you need to figure out if that's what you want. And, and that's sort of that, that similar, you know, trying to find a job that fits your work-life balance, that fits your career goals, that fits those goals you've created for yourself. Um, Brandy, and can so, I jump in? Yeah, you know, go ahead. I, you just reminded me of two things. Again, I've, I've been doing interviews lately and some people might be interested in two tidbits that you just prompted me to think of. Number one, you, you're right. 
when you're an interviewee, you are, you're looking for your fit to the company as much as they're looking for their, what they need for them. Um, so always be sure you have real questions to ask. Usually at the end, they'll say, do you have any questions for us? And if you just say, um, when do I start or what's the salary? They want, no, really, they want better questions than that. Um, but also, um, oh, what was the other thing that you made me think of? Oh, it's a good one too. Dang. I'll come back to me. Keep going. I was going to say, cause that, 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 you know, mentioning imposter syndrome, you know, that, that was that, yeah, that was sort of the, I was trying to get out, but framed much more eloquently, you know, with, with, you know, and I think that was, you know, the questions in the beginning of that was, you know, how do you like get over, you know, that, that, that you may have a natural internal tendency, or at least I know, know that I do to kind of assume I'm not. And then how do I like, commit? so yeah, I think it's, I think that's the crux of it is even if you feel like you're faking it, keep, keep moving forward and keep trying to represent yourself, you know, and cause it, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, keep going despite that, you know, I think is a, is a key, key aspect. Cause yeah, like everyone's been saying, you, you don't know what they're looking for. They may, they may not know that you're exactly what they're looking for until you kind of show them how. So. And I remembered the other thing too, and, and that is one of the script questions that we have in um, our interview process is a scenario and it's the scenario is, you're on a job site and blah, 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 something goes wrong. What do you do? And the answer that most people give is, um, I check this, I check that, I try a bunch of things, I keep troubleshooting, I keep troubleshooting, I keep troubleshooting. The answer we're looking for is, I ask somebody. Because you're, we're, you know, we're hiring somebody who's gonna be working with an experienced team that the people right there know the answer probably. Mm -hmm. And so the trap we get into early in our career is, Oh, they expect me to be like perfect and know everything. No, no. I expect you to um, want to learn and take advantage of the, the, the skills and the network around you. That is an important, oh, sorry. That, that is really important. That is something I, again, learned when I went to Woods Hole is that, you know, they would give me something to do and they would expect me to at least try to do it. Right. But then they would also say, I don't want you to waste a bunch of time right? Trying to figure this out when you can come over here and ask me and I'll be able to answer it immediately, right? So knowing that line, I think is really difficult. So even though that line is there and you like, you got to kind of figure out when, when do you need to work on it yourself? And when have you come to that point where it's time to ask somebody else? And um, if you have a really good mentor, a really good supervisor, they'll help you to know where that is. I think it's also really important for us to remember to be kind to ourselves during this process because I know, especially in the beginning, if you're interviewing or you're looking for grants or you're trying to get published, you know, there can be a lot of rejection. And I think, it, you know, the more that you can embrace it as with each thing that you do, you're refining your story, you're refining whether it's your research, how you, you engage with the world, how you engage with your work, um, then you're less focused on the, I guess, what, I guess it's just like important to be in the moment, be very present as we're like remembering that you're awesome and that the work is awesome and it's challenging and don't be up on yourself. Cause I think so much of us have this tendency to just use really, really negative words in our heads if we don't feel like we're meeting that bar or that standard, you know, especially in the, because it's a competitive industry that we're in. Um, and it's more now than ever with COVID-19 and all the, the changes that are taking place. So just really as much as we are expanding into pushing ourselves and creating that innovation, also just really love ourselves, I think is so important too. So it's something that you just hit on there, this idea that um, you're just a lot of negative self-talk. And I, I personally, when I was an undergrad, my first undergraduate advisor told me, I don't think you're going to make it. 
And like, I didn't even know what I wanted to do, right? I had no idea. I'm an undergrad. I'm just kind of flailing about. And he says, I don't think you're going to make it. I'm like, that's a terrible way for you to start, right? And, and he was not the only one. Like, I had several of those kind of situations, right, in my life. And I think that it is important to be able to get past that. So, so my question to the panelists is when you come from, you know, and this happens, I think, a lot in science where it's hard to sort of tell the difference between constructive criticism and just criticism, right? And, and if you're coming from maybe not a great, not a great, um, uh, what do you, you haven't come from a good supportive background, right? And you are dealing with imposter syndrome and things that may be a result of essentially trauma from someone telling you, you can't do this. And I think maybe it happens more with women, but I think it happens to everybody. Um, how do you get over that, right? With great difficulty. Yeah, it's a, that's a, it's a hard one because it's, it's like you said that the you know and, and people said earlier is that toxic situation it's not like there's a big sign that says toxic situation here you know most of mm -hmm. the the people that you know that sort of propagate toxic situation in some cases they don't even mean to right like there there can be well-meaning people that just aren't good at fostering you know, a culture and an environment to be supportive, you know, they say things off the cuff or they let things slide and it can create this real disconnect between, you know, here's this, this person that, I mean, it, it's not like they're a jerk, you know, it's not like they're, they're, mm -hmm. you know, that they're, they're a screaming evil person, you know, and, and so it kind of can make it difficult to even recognize that, you know, that that's, that's going on. And then, you know, even when you do recognize it, no matter how many times you tell yourself it's them, not me, it's very hard to, you know, it's very hard to internalize like, that. I mean, I think that's, you know, it, it's, there's no easy fix, but I, th I think things that can help are, I mean, that's where like peer networks, I think can, can help, you know, cause it's, again, it's not necessarily in every situation where somebody can fix the problem, but, you know, just being able to have that support and kind of that subtle, you know, no one's going to be able to come in and say, you know, give you a silver bullet and say, this is, this is, you know, this is, it's all better and, and they're wrong, but it's the sort of cumulative impact of having, you know, a network to talk to and to build you up. And just like you may not recognize the toxic situation, it isn't always easy to recognize when the support structure is coming in and, and helping. So, you know, it's, it's definitely not an easy fix, but it's, you know, having, you know, keep keeping the lean on that network to give the positive input to. Yeah, and for me, the thing that really helped was finding a mentor, right? Finding multiple mentors, people who would build me up and who would help me to think about things the right way, right? And, and get rid of all those negative thoughts, right? Um, and so that really helped me. And I, I mean, and IEEE was big for me, right? When I got into IEEE and I'm suddenly in these positions where people believe in me and people are giving me things to do and they're, you know, building me up and giving me the right kind of tools, right? Um, those made big differences for me. Uh, but, you know, prior to that, I was, I was very much, con you know, consumed with these negative thoughts. And once I got past those negative thoughts, that's when I really started to advance in my career, so. I say I don't, I don't have any more questions right now. I'm trying to think of one. Um, so I ended up uh, moving from Cape Cod, which I really loved, down to Mississippi, which I also really love. Uh, but when I first came here, I had multiple job interviews, right? I had multiple offers, and I, you know, trying to decide which one was the right for, fit for me. And this is before, like, I've done a whole lot of thinking since then. I think I would probably make better choices now. Um, but when you are searching for a job, whether it's because you have to have to move or because you want to move and you have multiple job offers, multiple um, opportunities for an interview, what would you tell, I guess, a young professional, like, should you take all the interviews? Should you, you know, I, I really wanted that, um, I guess I wanted the experience because I hadn't interviewed a lot. And I thought, well, even if I don't really want this job, I want to interview anyways because it's good experience. So I guess what would you tell someone who has multiple interviews, right? Should they just go into all of them with an open mind um, and, and see what happens? Oh, and how would they get them in the first place? That's a good question. And say, I, who, 
I'm going to go with Nikita. If nobody's jumping in, I'll make Nikita jump in. Okay, well, I haven't really done much uh, interviews um, in a way sort of that I guess had tried to be hiring because I, as an entrepreneur, um, I've, so I guess what I will say to this is I think opportunity is, is like where the magic happens because it's, it's important for you to, I, I always go back to clarity, you know, what is it that you want? When we talk about like, when you talk about your definition of success, what is that for you? And then I think when you have the opportunity to look at two or three potential job opportunities, which one aligns with whatever makes you really happy? What is your definition of success? Because um, I think that's what we have to keep aligned to is, you know, and letting go these, the expectations of what we think other people feel or need. Now, obviously that changes. Uh, if you're not single, if you have a family, you know, then there's a lot more of consultation that goes into the process. Um, but I, I think it's becoming really clear about what it is you're wanting, what excites you, you know, and then letting that I guide you. So we, um, we have another question that plays right into this. And then um, this is Alice Wang again. She wants to know what motivates each of you? What makes you happy? And how did you know, right, that that's what you wanted to do? So let's we'll start with Chris because he's being quiet over there. Suck him in. Um, I, th I think like I'd said in the original presentations, um, I'm still figuring it out. Um, the, the last question, the how did you know part, um, what makes me happy? Uh, I guess, I guess I have to sort of take back, well, not take back, take my own advice. I said, know yourself. And it's an ongoing process to know myself. I'm, I think that early on in my career, I was motivated by, um, uh, trying to be really good at what I did. And um, so maybe my su success was more, my, my definition of success was more technical. And I, I guess that made me happy to a certain extent, to a certain extent. But now what makes me ho more happy is um, uh, seeing people around me succeed. And um, yeah, I, I I'm not sure. Maybe I'll let someone else have a chance at that because uh, it, it's an ongoing process. I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> hey, Nikita, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, oh, so I fell in love with the ocean when I was a kid. And when I was 14, I got my first job on the snorkel boat. And I thought I had made it. You know, and so that from then I was going into marine science and growing up in the Bahamas, I, I saw that there were, it just didn't make sense to me. I was just like, our lives are based on the ocean, but yet we're destroying the ocean. And so that really was the catalyst that propelled me into doing the work that I do now. And a lot of it is from a, my island is sinking. <laughs> climate change is so real it's i mean there was wow. someone there was someone caught a shark in the middle of the road the other day i it's insane um and but what makes me happy and excites me is solving problems and connecting the dots and just doing the deep dives you know like again like last night i i i'm just love libraries and books and reading and when i was in university i would just they used to kick me out of the library at 2 a.m you know and that i think is just so much fun is the the discovery and making connections and so that's really what i do in all aspects of my life is is make connections and look at things from a really really high perspective and then you know, super low. 
Uh, and I'm so just powered by the ocean, just being in the ocean, spreading love for the ocean. Um, it is what gives me, it's my, like runs through my veins. <laughs> Soupy? So it's funny because I, 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 I'm almost the, not the opposite of the spectrum, but because I'm, I'm highly motivated by puzzles and getting to solve puzzles and new things and variety. So I, I like, I love being an oceanographer. You know, like I said, I, I wasn't, you know, I, my degrees are not all in oceanography and, and I've, you know, worked in careers that I've had fairly, you know, various, you know, differing focus you know, so for me, I, I need the variety to be happy. Um, so I, I have to have a, a job where I can do a lot of different things, work on a lot of different problems and kind of, kind of move around to different things because I, I, you know, I, I like doing, doing, you know, having the, Kind of that that new you know when you when you hit a new topic you sort of have to do the homework right you know you have to do the the lit review and kind of dig into it and learn about it and that was something I always loved you know growing up I was a school nerd and I, and I love that so I you know I, I I'm very happy when I have sort of new puzzles and new variety which uh, you know and that's that's an aspect you know it's different for different different jobs it's one that works you know I work for a small nonprofit now and that that is a good fit so I mean that's that's something career wise to kind of be important be self aware of you know whether you know because there are other people that I've seen that are just you know gangbusters at having you know expertise and just driving it forward you know and that's what makes them happy so. You know, I, I think it's self-awareness because <laughs> I'm definitely on the variety side. So. No. I'm also on the variety puzzle side. Like I really enjoy solving puzzles. I really enjoy the variety. I like lots of different things. And I love to work interdisciplinary, right? I like, I'm, I'm not a chemist at all. I'm not a biologist, but I love to work with chemists and biologists. I like to run the model and then they tell me what they need in the model and we all work together. And that's, that to me is the best part is just sort of the, the networking and having these multidisciplinary, um, but also mentoring. To me, I, um, I work a lot with students. And so, you know, I love what I do. And now I get to work with students who aren't sure if they love what they do yet, right? Um, so it's kind of fun to get to work with those students and let them, you know, bounce their energy off of me, right? And I have a lot of energy for students, so I enjoy that a lot. But I have another question, and this one is a little, um, I'm gonna say it's a little off topic. Off topic. Um, so this person says, until recently, I didn't know the huge scale and consequences of climate change. It wasn't in my face enough, and now I want to share this with everyone else. So how do you alarm people? How do you tell them about climate change and the human impacts without being annoying, right? Um, and I would sort of put this in the, the frame of like, if you're at work or if you know, like, because like my family's going to be annoyed at me no matter when I talk about these kind of things. Um, but at work, you might actually have, you know, an opportunity to talk to students or other people um, and on a professional level about this concern, right? And how would you go about doing that without um, creating a bad image of yourself or, or annoying people? This is a that's, soft skill, right? <laughs> that, I mean, that's a, that's a challenging, um, it's a challenging question. It's a challenging, it's, a, it's an important challenge for us as, well, I, I guess I don't, I'm not technically a scientist, but I, scientists, engineers, um, technological professionals, or whatever you want to term you want to use. Um, it's important for us to not wash our hands of that challenge because we are the, some of the people, not, not the only people, but ocean science, ocean sciences particularly, we are some of the people who have the direct observations that support the science. And so that's an important story to tell. On the other hand, it's obviously a topic that can easily get politicized and people can, you know, get entrenched in a position and, and, and conversations don't happen. So I don't have the, the answer for it other than to say that it is important for us when we do have, you know, access to the direct measurements, the data, the, you know, pr primary research to say that and say, hey, you know, uh, sure, I don't understand everything about it, but here's the bit that I know and the people that I'm working with, the, the, 
the area of expertise that I'm aware of, these people are, are genuinely concerned about finding truth or finding um, better explanations, doing good science and providing a benefit to society and humanity. And, and this is the best knowledge we have. Um, and, and, you know, it's not going to work for everybody. I don't think, I don't think it's going to be productive to alarm people. Um, you know, if you get into a argument, then you've kind of already lost, but it's important not to give up either. Yeah, I agree. I think there's um, a, a large number of people, you know, uh, managers and, and, you know, community planners and, and that can benefit from information on, you know, climate change and, and sea level rise and whatnot that are, you can have a really productive dialogue to give them information and to sort of quantify, you know, that they have a, 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 a sort of a data gap or an information gap that you can really help feel, fill. And that's very, you know, productive and that, that, you know, there's, there's so much of that to be done that I think, you know, it's similar to what Chris was saying. I think that's a very productive space, you know, to focus, you know, I, I think there's a whole nother realm that's sort of uh you know, where it crosses into folks, you know, belief system or ideology or what they, you know, what they, you know, are, are you know, what they, you know, are, are convinced is what's happening. And like what Chris is saying, you know, an argument isn't, you know, it's not going to really be productive. So, you know, there is this huge space to operate to get past long information to people and that can be very rewarding too. So. This is such uh, an interesting question because it shows the perspectives, right? The, the global perspectives on an issue. And as someone who's sitting here, you know, pulling into my driveway this just right before the talk, looking at my roof, knowing that, the, that myself and most Bahamians um, are in no way prepared for hurricane season. And I was just thinking, oh, I can't wait until mid-November because then, you know, like, then I'll get a break. But it's just, it's really interesting that even the conversation about climate change is annoying for people, right? That I think is uh, very reflective of the privilege that different people bring to the table when they talk about climate change. Because, and I always, you know, it's a critique I make often about the narrative Fridays for Future, you know, whereas in the Bahamas doesn't know how many people got washed out to sea last year with Hurricane Dorian, and we'll never know. You know, like just the impacts of climate change we live it every day, you know? And so I think it's really important and especially for everyone, those of us who are in conservation, be or in ocean science, just as is, how we show up in the world, it's not just about our publications. If we really are trying to protect the ocean, it means we have to have conversations about social justice which I know is a very, very sticky hot topic right now and uncomfortable for many people. But unless we can talk about these things and unless you become aware that your actions, your decision to buy something from one store versus the next literally impacts whether or not, you know, like, cause we're here in the Bahamas thinking like, oh, uh, we need to achieve 1.5 to limit global temperature to no more than 1.5 degrees or else we're not going to be here. And the global trends right now are looking at, at a four degrees temperature rise, you know? And so I think it's important for us to, I, I, it can be, this conversation can become very political, but I think connecting it to people like myself, like Islanders who like, this is a real issue, we can't just, you can choose to ignore it, but it exists. It's kind of like gravity. I mean, 
yeah. the pencil going to drop? <laughs> so um, I think we all have a very important role to play, especially um, those in positions of privilege. And all of us in the ocean sciences are in a position of privilege. Those are all really good answers. And I, I totally agree about it. It's, it's easy for people in, in um, a position of privilege, as you're calling it, to not think about things because they don't feel like they're being personally affected right now. Um, and, and it's hard to talk to those people sometimes about these things, but it is a difficult conversation that has to happen, right? And I think that we're now getting to that point where it is happening. Um, and we, we are the people, the young people who are going to make it, you know, make it happen. So I have one more question. We have eight minutes left, I think. We're done at six. So it says, when you're looking for a job career or change, job change, uh, what's the most important thing to look at? The type of job, the organization, or the person you're going to be working for? So go ahead. Well, I can, so I think all of those things are important to me. So, some of them are almost like um, whammies that they don't have to be, they don't have to be perfect, but they're the thing that if they're bad, nix it. So like, you know, boss or supervisor, I, for me at least, like, I don't need to have the world's best, best boss, but, you know, I, they need to cross some threshold of, you know, being, you know, supportive or allowing for my advancement that if, if they, you know, if, if they aren't supporting that, if I don't feel like, you know, I can, I can do that, then the other two things don't matter. But like I said, I also don't need the, the world's best, you know, boss, you know, like perfect boss. And I, I think, you know, organization is, is sort of similar, you know, it, it's not, it's not like, it's not necessarily the thing I would, would look for, seek out a job for, same with boss, but, you know, there would be certain red flags or, or issues where, you know, if I go in, into a, a, you know, an organization and I don't know what's expected to me, or if I, if I, you know, meet what is said to be expected and, and, you know, I'm still getting, getting grief or not advancing or, or, you know, that, that those sort of things would just on a day-to-day Great, you know, great on me, and I, I need, you know, wouldn't be a good, good place to be, you know. So I, I think the, for me, the, the type of job, like the type of work I'd be doing, like that's why I would seek out a position, you know, is, is what, what would make me happy in the day to day, like that for, for me, and this is totally obviously subjective and personal. That would, that would be kind of what, what would be the, the thing that would drive me to seek a job where the other two things would be looking for red flags that would over time, you know, make me unhappy if, if the organization type or the, you know, or the organizational culture or the, or the supervisor, you know, wasn't, you know, was going to be an impediment to me moving forward. Thank you, Derek. Chris? I don't have anything to add to that. I think I'd agree entirely. <laughs> I'm sort of along the same lines. Like if you're doing something that you love, as long as those other, as long as the organization and the boss are not horrible, right? You're probably going to be able to um, continue to do what you love. But if the, and I've been in one of those jobs where it just kind of wears on you and wears on you and wears on you until you like, I have to leave or my soul will be destroyed, right? I've been in that job and I got out of that job and now I have a new job. Um, it was the major motivation in me finding a new job. Just I felt like I mean, it wasn't a bad job. They weren't bad people, but it was just enough of, you know, not good for it to wear on me to a point where I had to leave, right? Um, and I think you'll will know that because you'll start to feel it. You'll start to hate going to work. You'll start to want to sleep in. You'll start to look for excuses to um, call in sick, right? Uh, and you'll know that it was bad. But being able to identify those things before you get the job, I think is sort of what this person is saying, right? And I think that hopefully you will see the red flags, right? Like Subi was saying, there's, there's going to be some red flag that jumps out hopefully um, before you take that job, which is why it's important to go to an interview with the mindset that you're also interviewing the job, right? The, the people at the job. So I think we've got five minutes left. Do you guys want to give any closing remarks? Any final words of wisdom? 
Yes. Oh, so have fun. I want, you know, really, I think that's the most important thing is that enjoy the process. My newest paradigm right now is opposed to thinking about life as a journey, thinking of life as a song. And you know, you just enjoy the entire song as opposed to trying to get somewhere. It's just like fun all the way through, even up and down, celebrate it all. Um, because I know everyone here is doing something really cool and contributing in an awesome way to supporting the advancement and the sustainability of our oceans. And so I want to inspire you and encourage you to keep going and keep sharing your gifts with the world because we need them. Is Dupe here, Chris? I think the only thing I'd say, especially, you know, if that some of the attendees may be maybe still in school and thinking about different options, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of, of sort of, uh, you know, we're supposed to be scientists, or, you know, or engineers and, and, and objective, but there's a lot of, of kind of bias that different people have on like types of jobs or types of careers, you know, academia versus private sector versus, you know, and, and sort of these stereotypes or whatever on it. And that, they are all totally legitimate career paths. They are all totally open there. None of them are better than any of the others. And, you know, especially, you know, like I said, I think coming out of, of school, you know, you're, you're around like the academic community. And so obviously there are people in the academic community. They're in the academic community. They love being in the academic community, you know? So I, you know, I think the, the, something that I wish someone had told me earlier was to kind of expand out thinking about options because it, you know, there's sort of this inertial thing from that pipe because again, you know, and if, if you want to go into academia, that's great too. You know, it's just that there's you know, sort of that cognizance that maybe a lot of what you'll hear about when you're in school is academia because well, it's school. So I think that's the, the big piece I might say to think, think more broadly. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for attending. I really enjoyed the conversation and I hope you did too. Um, be sure to visit our visual, virtual booths this week. There's, you know, virtual swag. You can earn points. I've heard that there's hundreds of dollars in rewards to be given out to the highest scorers. So um, go and check those out. And if you head out to the society booth, you can get society swag, virtual Zoom backgrounds. You can see Chris has one right now. Um, and uh, we'd love to see you and talk to you about more YP uh, opportunities. And I hope we'll see you all tomorrow in the soft skills panel, or sorry, soft skills session. It's not a panel. Um, and we'll learn more about how to use your soft skills, um, which is maybe something you didn't focus on as much in school as you would have liked. So thank you all again. Thank you for attending. And thank you all the panelists. It was really great talking with everyone. <laughs>